Now, if you were to ask me who I was growing up, I would tell you with complete conviction a football player. I used to carry around a ball with me wherever I would go. My parents still joke that sometimes I slept cradling a ball. Instead of doodling, I would drop plays out in the margins of my notes. And on Sundays, the couch was my pew and the TV my sermon. Then, midway through my freshman year, I received my third severe concussion playing football. I ran to the wrong sidelines crying uncontrollably. I couldn't remember eight of the 12 months, any of the days of the week, the names of my uncles and aunts. That's what I'm told, at least. My mother, after seeing her son miss nearly a month of school, told me I was no longer allowed to play football. I did all the things upset teenagers do. I told my parents I hated them. I threatened to move out and run away. I would call up my best friend's house, intending to ask if I could sleep over there. And as soon as I heard a voice, hang up. I hardly ever think about football now. Sometimes I forget I even played. Looking back, I wonder why that boy who slept cradling a ball had such narrow aspirations. But sports, especially at a young age, inhabit our identities. They're what we're known for, our family for a given season, our purpose. Sports provide an easy band-aid answer to that ever-important teenage question of where do I belong. It's right there on the field. Now, if you were to ask me who I am today, I would say with much less conviction a photographer. I am obsessed with the photo's ability to convey and display experience. A photograph allows the viewer a portal into a social setting or place that they would otherwise be foreign to. As I began to think about what I wanted to photograph, I was brought back to my past identity as a football player. I wanted to know whether the sport should even be played, and whether my mother was correct in not allowing me to. The best way to find answers was through my camera. I photographed a main high school football team attending almost every practice and game. I was let into the school, locker rooms, players' houses. I tried my best not to be a fly-on-the-wall photographer, but be an actor within the team, part of the football fraternity. Now, I knew I was finally in when I got my nickname, something every player had, which was bread, which I still don't know what it means, and they laugh at every time. Um, one week, the running back had three turnovers, so I nicknamed him Captain Fumble, and then I was Toast, Bread Who Roasts. The next week, I missed practice for my midterms, and then I was creatively Crumb, part of the bread I used to be. <laughs> the football team had a surprisingly small social presence in the town and community. It was nothing close to the stereotypical American scene of the town closing down on Friday nights. No, often there were more students in the band than there were classmates watching the game. And this football team was good. They were state runners up. But the team had a really hard time recruiting players. They really struggled to field complete teams. Every player was indispensable to the program. I shot this entire project on medium format film, using a camera, the Hasselblad SWC, that has no mechanism for me to see an image before I take it. This means that essentially for every photograph, I had to guess the exposure. Now, most photographers would likely roll their eyes at this uncertainty, but it was important for me for these photos not to appear manufactured. I had to forget about focus sharpness, forget about perfect exposures, and instead just document what was in front of me. As long as the moment was caught on the silver on the back of the film, that was a good photo for me. In the mid-90s, this team was in shambles and on the brink of collapse when an alumni who graduated in the mid-60s restarted it. 
He had played three seasons with the New York Giants and took a team of, and I quote, knuckleheads into multi-time state champions. 20 years later, although immobilized to a golf cart, he still coached the team, along with more alumni, stars of teams past, and parents. The football team was a fraternity. The players called each other brother, even with those who had graduated before. During the games, alumni wouldn't watch the game in the stands, but right next to the team on the sideline. When I asked one of the kids what football was like to him at this school, he explained to me that football wasn't just what we did after school. It was a way of life. Now, this community was particularly hard for me to understand and rationalize. It was nothing close to the stereotypical American Hollywood idea of remember the Titans or Miracle on Ice, where this group of distant young men come together, becoming friends and hoisting the trophy at the end. No, sports may have been the mechanism for this community, but it was something much more severe. Football was a pseudo-religion to these boys, where playing the sport was really only the ceremonial practice. Putting on a helmet was the equivalent of a baptism into this brotherhood, one which, regardless of difference, bonded these boys together. However, as I began spending more time with these kids, I began to notice alarming behavior, especially directed at those who were different. A few moments stick out. At one practice, a fight broke out between two players after one called another a homophobic slur. The coach took the moment to gather the team together, saying, there's no need for that language here. We know there's none of those on this team. The three students of color were constantly subjected to racist remarks. The one Hispanic student was often called green card, and one of the two black students, mocha. When rap songs were played in the locker room, white students didn't refrain from saying anything. When I interviewed these students and asked them what they thought about these remarks, one of them replied, I don't really think about it. It's been better here than anywhere else. The kids would also act obscenely. Before games, a number of players would take what they called the lethal dose, which was four extra strength ibuprofen, Adderall, and I didn't see this at the time, but a player told me afterwards they would also take three to four shots. When it was a visiting game, the players would urinate in the, lock, or in the shower of the opposing team's locker room, not running the water so that it would stay there and smell. When I asked, isn't that close to what dogs do? One of the students replied, we're hogs, not dogs. As I spent more and more time with this team, I began noticing a connection between these players wanting to show affection to one another and not wanting to be labeled gay or soft. Although this team was incredibly close, they constantly rejected being vulnerable. And instead, they defended themselves by putting others near them down. Just as they earned praise on the field by seeing who could be the most violent, this was carried off into the social spaces where they earned respect by being emotionally disparaging. My time with the football team taught me that the common phrase football builds character is a myth. In the homes, locker rooms, and buses, Football and its emphasis on violence seeped into the social culture. Football doesn't build character. It reveals it. And this intense brotherhood that was braided with football's volatile tradition begs the question whether the sport should be played at all. Now, two weeks ago, I was showing my mom the photos from this project and telling her the stories I just told you today. She asked me five years later if I would forgive her for not letting me play football. I still couldn't. Thank you.